Imagine, if you will, a world where a man in charge of a massive social media platform believes Trump is bad, A. Eh? All this and more on the Self Evident Podcast. Hey guys, welcome to the Self-Evident Podcast. Today we are definitely going to be covering um, Zuckerberg because a letter came out and of course there was an interview he gave about a week after the assassination attempt and, and I just want to go through some of this and I've got clips and I've got slides and I've got all the stuff for you to cover. Is it legit? Is he actually recognizing that it's not good to crawl in bed with the government or is it just another move to make and so we'll cover all of that and we'll get there uh do not forget man we do still have our fundraiser drive we're driving for thirty thousand dollars we are driving for the end of the year please go to the self truth.com click that donate button become a monthly sponsor part of our torchbearer society maybe think about raising your monthly or give a one-time donation, whatever you feel called to do, but please go to the self truth.com and pray about clicking that donation button or at least get yourself some merch, get a t-shirt, get what you need to make waves around you. Okay. Let's get started on this because this is, this is fun. Now we could go back to just about any time of when Facebook has been around, and I'll leave the chat on for you guys. But there were a few things that really encapsulated people's reactions to Facebook. And you may notice on the promotional, I said, look, you may have to find this on another platform because don't be surprised if the fact I'm talking about Facebook or Zuckerberg limits reach on this thing or gets it shut down. So you can find us on YouTube. You can find us on Rumble. If you want to listen to it, you can go to iTunes, you can go to Spotify, all the podcast platforms. We're on pretty much all of them. All right. I want to start off on a story that the news cycle is 24-7. Let's admit that. You and I, we're, we're friends. We're sitting here. We can look at each other and go, the news cycle is just constant. There's just so much going on. And a week seems like a year now. And maybe you remember, maybe you don't, the Hunter Biden laptop story, right? So if you don't remember, here goes. I'm going to give you 15 seconds. A few months before the election, a computer repair store owner made public a laptop that had been left by Hunter Biden, which this is no longer in dispute. It's been proven and accepted even by the court system that it was his laptop. But mind you, when this came out, New York Post ran the story, including images and emails that were very incriminating. And immediately, the intelligence community came out with over 50 former intelligence officials agreeing that it was Russian disinformation. And what they do? They Twitter flat out blamed the New York Post. They banned them. Uh, Facebook got involved in well as well. And Marky Mark, our good old friend Zuckerberg. He explained to Joe Rogan a couple of years ago the situation. I'm going to go ahead and play this clip for you. The background here is the FBI, I think, basically came to us, uh, some, some folks on our team. It was like, hey, um, just so you know, like, you should be on high alert. There was the, we, we thought that there was a lot of Russian propaganda in the 2016 election. We have it on mm. notice that basically there's about to be some kind of dump of... of um, uh, uh, the FBI came to him and, oh, there's about to be something big going on. So just keep your eyes open and, you know, d d just go ahead and crush this story for us if you could. As though that was the first time ever that the FBI had come to them, right? And he kind of just, eh, yeah, well, you know, they came to us and told us about this thing and, and we're used to getting reports of stuff that we should... We should censor, we should get rid of, that kind of thing. 
which I'll talk about that in a second. Now, studies from Technometrica, recognized as the most accurate pollster in recent presidential elections, suggests that 47% of people said they would have changed their vote had they known the laptop was real and not Russian disinformation. In other words, if that news had actually been allowed to go out into the news cycle, it very easily could have changed the election. But it got suppressed. And everybody was, was gaslit on the whole thing. They told you you were crazy for saying, no, this is legit, like the pictures look real uh, and the emails sure sound real. No, 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 Russian disinformation. You're Russian, aren't you? Aren't you all Russians? And so anybody who talked about it got hammered by the social media platform people. Then, so this was right before the election, then right after the election, the COVID suppression began. And in July of 2023, and you may have missed this, you, you didn't realize this had happened, but Rep. Jim Jordan went to town on X. He released documents and emails proving that the White House had back channels heavily pressuring Facebook to derank, suppress, and remove content that promoted vaccine hesitancy. We're going to go to slide one on this one. So we're going to read this. This is one of the emails. This email to Mark Zuckerberg and Sheryl Sandberg stated, we are facing continued pressure from external stakeholders. You, you know what I want to know? Who are those stakeholders? Who is it that is pressuring Facebook? Oh, you've got to get rid of this vaccine hesitancy stuff. And why is the White House wrapped up in all of that? And, the, and they, it goes on, including the White House and the press, to remove more COVID vaccine discouraging content. Oh, now it's not even disinformation. It's just content that might discourage you from going to get it. For example, the email continues, we recently shared with the White House a list of top 100 vaccine-related posts on Facebook in the U.S. for the week of April 5th to April 11th. While authoritative information dominated the list, the White House was concerned that the number three post was, su was a vaccine-discouraging humorous meme, and they called on us to delete the meme. In fact... That meme was so offensive that Andy Slavitt of Obamacare fame, he was also a White House senior advisor and head of COVID response, he berated the Facebook staff. Now, in an email, this email said something interesting, but I'm going to read the whole thing because listen to this information. Listen to the conversations they're having going on on this. This is, this is wild that these conversations were going on in Facebook Facebook about the conversations they're having with the White House and with the government. Andy attended a meeting of misinfo researchers, didn't provide names, organized by Rob F. on Friday in which the consensus was that Facebook is a, quote, disinformation factory and that YouTube has made significant advances to remove content leading to vaccine hesitancy while we have lagged behind. In other words, YouTube stepped up. And you saw channels and, and videos getting crushed by YouTube if they ever mentioned the word vaccine. Whilst appreciative of our emphasis on authoritative vaccine, the principal focus for Andy S. and his team in the coming weeks is to reach the hardest-to-reach people who have a propensity to consume vaccine-hesitant-related content and who are not swayed by official authoritative sources of content? <gasps> you found me. You found me. I thought I was lost, but you found me. And I matter to you. Aww. They continue, our systems, he believes, as confirmed by the researchers, feed vaccine-hesitant related content to pockets of the population. And that's the problem he wants our help to resolve. And the email says... I'm reading as a quote. As an EG, he was outraged. Not too strong a word to describe his reaction. 
that we did not remove this post, which was third most highly ranked post in the data set we sent him. Now, what was that post? What, what was Mr. Andy just so upset about? What, whoa, heavens, what was he clutching pearls about? Because vaccine hesitancy. This one. Ten years from now, you'll be watching TV and hear, did you or a loved one take the COVID vaccine? You may be entitled. And it's got Leonardo DiCaprio in a movie pointing at the TV like, yeah. I like the meme. But Andy was so offended by that meme that he berated Facebook staff. Berated them over this meme. How dare you allow this meme, right? Dictatorships, authoritative governments, tyrannical governments hate to be made fun of. If you look at the Soviet Union, they hated comedy. If you look at China, Comedy, it's a tight line. You say one thing that maybe criticizes the government. Man, you, you could be done. And it's happened. So now we have a government that is telling Facebook to get rid of memes mocking their suggested vaccine program. Are you so thin-skinned? Are you so insecure about the use and value of what you're trying to push on us, that if we make fun of it a little bit, that all hell breaks loose? Now, either you, you see the American as so absolutely stupid that a single meme will change their mind completely of what they were going to do, or you recognize the power of humor and the weakness of your position. I'll wait. I'll let you think about it. So yes, a meme. A meme set them all ablaze. And Facebook tried to argue that banning this meme would represent, quote, represent a significant incursion into traditional boundaries of free expression in the U.S. This was in one of the emails. This would represent a significant incursion into traditional brown boundaries of free expression. Slavit, good old Andy, replied that the post was directly comparing COVID vaccines to asbestos poisoning in a way which demonstrably inhibits confidence in COVID vaccines amongst those the Biden administration is trying to reach. Oh, we need them. So we've just, we, we've got to get rid of anything that might mock it because it a little too close to home, maybe. Now, to shorten up a long story, Facebook felt they had to double down and play ball with the Biden administration, or the White House might turn on them. So one of the emails flat out said, given what is at stake here, it would also be a good idea if we could regroup to take stock of where we are in our relations with the White House and our internal methods too. And so they even asked their teams on misinfo policy and product policy to brainstorm additional policy levers to be more aggressive against COVID misinfo. They even said themselves it stemmed from the continued criticism of our approach from the U.S. administration. In other words, they got so battled in all of it, so, so beaten down by the government that they're like, but they just keep criticizing it. So we've, we've got to figure out something so they stop criticizing. Just please stop criticizing. But that sounds like a great government to be in bed with. And, and the, all of this information goes into our discussion about Zuckerberg. I get it. I haven't gotten to him yet. Save the best for last, right? Because I'm going to show you some things that he's done lately that on the surface look good, but you really kind of wonder, okay, with this past history, is this, can you trust it? And, and what is really going on here? Because you can't help but see something happening as we cover this. Now, mind you, it gets worse with this whole COVID thing. So they actually had a policy that they wrote up for the Surgeon General 
because that matters of Facebook deregulating, deranking, suppressing information matters to the Surgeon General. And they had what was called the Disinfo Dozen. Now, this group, interestingly enough, the Center for Countering Digital Hate came out with this group list, which just so happens to be Facebook's go-to group list, and is, was approved by the Surgeon General. And the CCDH, we may have to do a podcast on them. The, the, all of You know what I find as I go farther down this rabbit hole is how intertwined all of these groups are and how revolving door it all is. And so when you look at, like I talked about yesterday, if you look at the web that it is between government and big business and corporations, people will point the finger and say, these evil, awful, big corporations. Yeah, and who is helping them along? Who's holding them by the hand? Who is sending them people and taking people? Governments. They're all in bed together. That, that's not capitalism. That is an abomination. And looking at the emails, it looks pretty bad. And our new hero... I'm joking. RFK Jr. He was on Tucker Carlson. I'm going to I'm this is a longer one. I'm going to stop it at points because I want to discuss this with you. He made some good points to fill in the gaps and and show yeah, this is as bad as it seems because he was one of those ones on that list of the disinfo dozen. And so let's go ahead and start this. I'm an injunction right now against the Biden White House to enjoin them from censoring me which they've been doing. They, the the 155-page decision by Judge Doty details everything that happened 37 hours after he took the oath of office. President Listen. Biden's White House opened up a portal for the FBI to begin to have access to social media posts on all the different social medias. All right. So 37 hours after they get into the White House, they are immediately opening up back doors to get into people's social media posts and platforms. Why? Why do you need that? Why, why do you have access to that? What is the, the search warrant to getting access to somebody's private property like that? That's interesting. It's almost as though Facebook just let them do it. But we'll continue. And they, the FBI then invited in the CIA, the DHS, the IRS, and CISA. CISA is this new agency that is the center of the censorship industrial complex that is in charge of making sure Americans don't hear things that their government doesn't want them to hear. Oh, thank goodness we have a ministry of truth. I'm so thankful because... I just want to be safe. And I believe it was the New York Times not too long ago came out with an article about why government censorship and government control makes you safe. Don't you feel more safe? But he's not done yet. And those agencies and other agencies, including the health agencies like CDC, were given access to go into the social media sites and change posts and slow walk things and uh, and shadow ban posts that it was part of that effort and they removed my Instagram account I had almost a million followers I they say it was for misinformation but they could not point to a single post that I ever made that was factually erroneous and they so he he got banned but the and he's like okay prove to me show me where I've been wrong actually Facebook pushed back in the email chain. You can see Facebook pushing back at the White House and saying, well, wait a minute, he's not, um, this isn't misinformation. This is, this is not factually erroneous. What they're saying is actually true. And they had to invent a new word, which is called malinformation. So he goes on, and, and I'll go ahead and end it there. But he goes on to say that this process was something that the White House and the intelligence agencies were forcing on Facebook. 
And he is right. The emails do show that at points, Facebook was not happy. Now, he goes on to say that the the internal emails in Facebook are like, we're dealing with wicked people here. Like, this, this is just downright wrong. And they're right, yet they still did it. And there was a reason that they kept doing it was because, again, that crossroads. I go back to this. Take stock of where we are in our relationship with the White House. They knew, they knew that if they didn't play ball, the White House could come after them. And more than likely, Zuckerberg was watching Elon Musk. If you'd forgotten all the SEC stuff that kept going on and all the crap that went on before he bought X, and then some tiny little investor at some point wanted to mess with his bonus and so threw a wrench in the plans and brought up a lawsuit and all of it. Like, Musk has put up with a lot. And now Zuckerberg has sat in front of some committees. That's sure, yeah, yeah. What's happened, though? What's happened? I mean, he's he's been embarrassed a little bit. And I'll actually, I'll skip to another clip. Now, this clip is really interesting. And just follow the whole thing. I'm not going to interrupt much because Ted Cruz does it himself to prove the importance of this. But if you want to get a taste of the milk toast nature of Facebook, this is how you do it. This is how you show that passive milk toast approaches will allow evil. Instagram also displayed the following warning screen Listen to, to individuals who were searching for child abuse material. So people who were searching got this screen, this warning screen. He's pointing the, it out on a These black results screen. may contain images of child sexual abuse. And then you gave users two choices. He's talking to Zuckerberg. Get resources or see results anyway. Yeah, you heard that right. You, you heard that right. Get resources, see results anyway. Now, if I post something about COVID, well, by all means, if, if I post a meme comparing it to an asbestos poisoning commercial. Well, get that off of there. Man, I might need to be banned. How many of you as our friends have been suspended, put in, quote unquote, Facebook jail? And Zuckerberg's response is very telling, but, but Ted Cruz puts it to him for a second. Mr. Zuckerberg, what the hell were you thinking? Yeah, right? All right, Senator. Um, <laughs> the, the, the basic science behind that is that when people are searching for something that is problematic, it's often mm -hmm. helpful to, rather than just blocking it, to help direct them towards something that, um, that oh. could be helpful for getting them to get help. It, 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 oh, 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 okay. Yeah, we're just going to talk about the one option. We're, oh. Talk about the other options. What I understand, get resources in what sane universe <laughs> is there a link for C results anyway? <laughs> well, because we might be wrong. We we try to trigger oh. this this uh, warning, or we tried to, um, when we think that there's any chance that the results. Okay, you might, might be, be wrong. wrong. Let me ask you, how many times was this warning screen displayed? I don't know, but the but the hey, you, you don't know. Why don't you know? I, I I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head. No. <laughs> oh, okay. Makes perfect sense. But why would you show them the results anyway? Well, we may have gotten it wrong. What? So you'll let them search for that stuff? Because you, you don't want to get it wrong on that one. Those search terms, those key phrases... Well, we've got to be very careful about what we're parsing out. And, well, we don't always get it right, so we'd rather just, you know, let, let them see everything instead of jail. Hmm. This is pretty interesting, isn't it? That when presented with something so egregious, their response is, Get resources, see results anyway. 
and when he's presented with this, it's basically like, yeah, well, I mean, we might get it wrong, so we don't want them to not see the results. What? And this is why I don't buy it. I'm going to show you what I don't buy. Zuckerberg wrote a letter just a couple of days ago to the House. And in his letter to Jim Jordan, he admitted the government pressured them. And he says, quote, In 2021, senior officials from the Biden administration, including the White House, repeatedly pressured our teams for months to censor certain COVID-19 content, including humor and satire, expressed a lot of frustration with our team when we didn't agree. Now, while he admits that the choices were ultimately theirs and they were responsible for that, he points the finger back at the government. He, he continues, I believe the government pressure was wrong. I don't disagree with you. And I regret that we were not more outspoken about it. I also think we made some choices that, with the benefit of hindsight and new information, we wouldn't make today. Oh, really? Like I said to our teams at the time, I feel strongly that we should not compromise our content standards due to pressure from any administration in either direction. Oh, there it is. And we're ready to push back if something like this happens again. Ah, but you weren't ready to push back the first time. Now, what could possibly happen where you would push back? And you say both administrations. And at least he lets it out a little bit of, hey, they pushed us. They pressured us. Our responsibility, but we gave in. And there's, there's almost this sense of like, yeah, dang, man, it was tough. Now, I want you to watch this interview that he does. And this is kind of the crux of the whole thing. And I want you to watch him very carefully. We're going to break him down. We're going we're gonna to psychologically profile this guy. Because what do I know? I drive a high low. All right, you ready? I want to talk about the 2024 election. Okay. Um, Facebook has been a flashpoint in many elections mm -hmm. around the world. And you personally have been called out, most recently by former President Trump. Yep, he gets called out a lot, so it's not just, you know, by Trump, but anyways. Big election. What do you think is at stake? Well, I mean, look, it's, it's obviously a very important and it'll be a historic election. Uh now, I can't tell, and you've got to watch the video to get the facial mannerisms, but there seems to be some type of acting going on. And I can't tell if he just, he's, he's trying to be natural at it and just not great at it, or if he's acting because he's got to try and make himself feel reasonable and human, enter all the robot wizard jokes. But it gets worse in terms of how he tries to present himself. You know, I feel like I'm best positioned maybe to talk about what our role will be in it and what we're going to do. And Fair enough. And look, I mean, the main thing that I hear from people is that they actually want to see less political content on our services because they come to our services to connect with people. So, you know, that's what we're going to do. Um, we're, we give people control over this, but we're generally trying to recommend less political content. Ooh. So... If you wonder why you don't see notifications for the Self-Evident Podcast, it's probably because we're too political. Even if we stuck to all the history stuff, the fact that we're talking about the government, we're talking about the Constitution, we're talking about conservative values is political. And this is kind of a, a bomb drop that I don't think people heard. What he's saying is, well, everybody I talk to, they don't want politics on their Facebook and they're kind of sick of it. So we're just going to stop recommending it, and we're going to suppress it. So have you learned your lesson? No. Your approach now is, well, we, we want to be a fun connection platform. And, and here's where I think there's probably a 
good intentions pave the road to hell situation. My guess is he's approaching this from a common, a, a real world sense of, look, politics divide people. They make people mad. It's just a big hornet's nest. Is there a way we can get the platform away from politics and into just people sharing photos of their dogs and their cats again? How do we do this to where people can connect, right? And Ashley says, they could just butt out and let folks decide what they want to see. Exactly. And I, I, you can tell they're trying to take an active approach to, well, we just want to be a wholesome website. If what he's saying is true, and that's the crux of it, and they're going to suppress political stuff, which Facebook is really a, a political, um, <laughs> it's a, a, a gladiator battle. Um, it's a coliseum <laughs> of, of political debate. And guys, just as a, a little hint to you, stop with the political debates on Facebook. Now, oh, ironic. The guy doing the political podcast is like, stop talking about politics on Facebook. Not what I'm saying. I'm not saying you can't have political discussions. What I'm saying is stop with the stupid debates where you know you're not going to convince the other person and it's just personal ad hominem attack and it's stupid talking points and all. I get discussion. I get debate. I have friends who love to just needle people and start the debates and let people fly and it's kind of fun and there's some entertainment value in it, but be wary, okay? Like, do you actually have to die on that hill? That's the question. Is that the hill that you actually have to die on with your Facebook post? Now, that being said, actually, I agree. It, you're doubling down with bad decisions if you're going to then approach this and say, oh, well, you know, we're, we're just going to suppress all of that political stuff. As though... Well, now we're going to suppress both. But let's keep going. Um, so I think you're going to see our services play less of a role in this election than they have in the past. And, and personally... Um, okay, sorry, I paused. Also planning spot. on playing a, not playing a significant role in the election. And I've done some stuff personally in the past. I'm not planning on doing that this time. Um, and that includes you know, not endorsing either of the candidates. Um, now look... So what he's talking about is last election cycle, and I'll, I'll, yeah, I may lose it. Either way, what he's talking about last election cycle is that he and his wife, through their foundation or whatever it was, were pumping money, and people argued it's helping Democrats. He makes the argument, all of our research showed it, it didn't help Democrats, it helped both. But in his letter, he even says, we're going to pull back our contributions. Now, he doesn't say how much. He doesn't say we're going to stop. Um, he just says, we're not going to do it like we did it, right? Now, he continues. There's a lot of crazy stuff going on in the world. I mean, the historic events. Over Watch last, this close. Like, over the weekend. And I mean, on a personal note. That was so fake. I'm, I'm going to rewind it. It was so fake. <sighs> well, on a personal note. It was like, he planned that. He did that in the mirror at 4.30 in the morning before the interview. He was standing there with his toothbrush in his hand going, well, on a personal note, you're a robot, dude. Watch this. Includes, you know, not endorsing either of the candidates. Um, now, look, I mean, there's obviously a lot of crazy stuff going on in the world. I mean, the historic events over the last, like, over the weekend. And, I mean, on a personal note, it's... You know, I mean, seeing Donald Trump get get up after getting shot in the face and pump his fist in the air with the American flag is one of the most badass things I've ever seen in my life. But um, and I think, look, it's, at some level, it's I'm asking for a friend. You think that's fake? You think he really means it? Do you think? Well. On a personal note, I just want to say that Donald Trump getting back up after getting shot is pretty bad. 
what's the angle, dude? What's the angle? Why are you doing that? Why are you trying to ingratiate yourself to the MAGA crowd, to Trump? Why? It, because to me, that was... It, it was not legit. It was not genuine. It was not a true look, man. I I don't care where we're at in terms of politics. Like that was pretty cool. I wish I could see somebody I support do that. You know, like and and Jonathan says forced, if not fake. Absolutely, it was. <laughs> it was like he had to swallow and prepare himself, but it was. It's just funny because if you watch bad acting, there's not a flow to bad acting. There is just a, it's it's rough, it's often over-exaggerated at the wrong points, and then it's underwhelming at the other points, and the facial expressions don't necessarily match perfectly with what's going on. Whereas with good acting, there's a, a suspense of disbelief, and you you believe what's going on. You're you're transported into the story. And that's my question for you is, are you transported into the story when he's telling that? I don't think so. And some people have talked about for this guy, he's had a shift. There, there has been a change in Zuckerberg. And rightly so they say this. I mean, this was him before. And some people have pointed out, they kind of wonder like, was it the internet abuse that this guy took that really kind of made him start to change his ways? Because this was him. And, and people pointed out, guy looks like a lizard. He acts like a robot. You know, there's that famous, famous moment in a congressional hearing where he's taking a sip of water and everybody's like, no human drinks water like that. And there does seem to be some type of social anxiety or, or social awkwardness, which could be expected. I mean, even if you're a billionaire and you're a tech mogul in Silicon Valley, like that doesn't mean that you are super smooth with social situations. And so you could say that that interview that he was doing, it was more of like, this is him practiced to give a inter an interview. And, and part of it showed as like a a sense of he's trying to give an interview and seem interesting in the interview. But now, this is him. And uh, there's a picture that I decided not to post, but it's of him shirtless, and he's he's fairly ripped now. So he's doing jiu-jitsu. He is now a blue belt in jiu-jitsu, which is is pretty darn good, right? That's, that's intense. Um, he's working out. He's growing his hair out a little bit more so he doesn't have that like weird shaped head thing going on. And people wonder, and this is this was the thought that people are wondering, where is this redemption arc more true than not true? And maybe he is really just like, I'm so sick of being in the middle of this mess and this machine. I need to I need to push it off a little bit. Jiu-jitsu is a martial art, obviously. It, I want to tell you the obvious and the not so obvious in life. And I want to be sure to describe to you all things and give you all details. So I will start with the beginning that you may not understand or know. Jiu-Jitsu is a martial art. Now, if you walk past that and you walk down the stairs into the depths of knowledge that you may not understand, Jiu-Jitsu, especially like the guys that are attracted to mixed martial arts and Jiu-Jitsu, they, they're self-sufficient guys, individualistic. They're, they're, self-development type guys. Probably not every single one of them, but most of them. I think I can, I can make a, a judgment on that. And there was actually a study that showed there is a direct correlation between bicep size and conservative leanings in men. And the reason is thus. Guys who work out, guys who look to self-improve, guys who develop themselves, especially on the physical plane, they become more self-sufficient, therefore more individualistic because they can take care of themselves. And they're like, just stop. I'll take care of it myself. I got this. And one wonders with him, is this one of those moments where he is becoming developed out of this like 
super computer nerd tech guy that's always been around science and all of that. And he's actually, he's taking on more physical adventures, especially something like jujitsu and learning a lot about himself and becoming a bit more middle of the road than he would have been five years ago. And Jonathan said, dude, he is a lifelong computer nerd. Of course he is socially awkward. Exactly. So like that interview I will give him a small benefit of the doubt in the sense that, yeah, he's he's socially awkward computer nerd guy. But to me, that Trump line was forced, at least, if not fake, for a reason. But I do believe that there may be a bit of a renaissance going on within him. And Jonathan said, ah, so that's why I'm so conservative. Yes, biceps like muscle peaks on Jonathan. Himalayas, you have nothing on Jonathan's peaks. The bicep peaks. Anyways, <laughs> I think I think this is one of those situations where Zuckerberg is probably changing, but it's probably more by small degrees as opposed to lengths. And you are not going to see him I do not believe, all of a sudden teaming up with Team Trump and being added to the group. And I think a lot of people would probably question it if he did. And so why does all of this matter? What What's important about all of this? Because you're like, okay, yeah. So what did, what do you think? I think the censorship thing is so pervasive right now. I've got a hard time believing that Zuckerberg stumped so hard for the left and the Dems last season and did what he needed to do for them and always swung liberal and now suddenly he's trying to out Elon Elon. I don't think that's the route he's going. I, I think he's probably having a shift within him. But there's too much evidence that shows that all of the major social media platforms have their hands on the scales in an active way. So testimonies out of Texas... Recent testimonies show that Google will recommend liberal content as much as 75% of the time to people of every political persuasion in Texas, aka liberals, moderates, independents, Democrats, and conservatives. I just did a horseshoe for you. That can't be a fluke in this system. That is finger on the scales. And let's not forget the Supreme Court ruling that states suing over the issue didn't have standing, okay? The AP reported the states had argued that the White House communication staffers, the Surgeon General, the FBI, and the U.S. Cybersecurity Agency are among those who applied unrelenting pressure to coerce changes in online content on social media platforms, which, hey, Supreme Court, we just went through the emails that showed that, but this is what they said. The justices... The AP says this, the justices appeared broadly skeptical of those claims during arguments in March and several worried that can, common interactions between government officials and the platforms could be affected by a ruling for the states. I've got a solution, though. You don't need communication between the government and the social media platforms outside of a warrant. <laughs> that would be great. I, I don't understand why. FBI, NSA, CIA, CISA, IRS, RFK went on to name the IRS, all having access, unfettered access, through the back door. I don't understand that. Government doesn't need to communicate with our social media platforms, and frankly, I'd rather you not. And so, I think with a situation like this, the larger question is, why do believe, we believe that just because a government can slip and slide its way around the First Amendment by merely suggesting to platforms who to remove and what to censor that they should? Why are we allowing the government to decide what is true or false? Who put it on their plate that they had to determine truth? Because guess what? Just like we say about life and death, if they can determine when life begins, they can determine when it ends. If they can determine what truth is, they can determine when it's not. And then you have a great space for the ministry of truth to get set up. They're not here to protect us from ourselves. 
I didn't hire you to protect me from myself. I don't need you outlawing big gulps because you're afraid I might intake a truckload of sugar. Now, some people will. And heaven help them. They will not have bicep peaks like Jonathan. They'll be more of the rolling hills of... Anyways, but we know that he hasn't truly bucked the system, Zuckerberg, okay? He has not truly bucked the system. You want to know how we know? Because if he did, he would end up more like Pavel Durov, Telegram's CEO, who was arrested by the French because he resisted giving in to government's request to censor things they didn't like. He left Russia when they were trying to persuade him to censor anti-government groups. Now, a few hours ago, Durov was just released, but he's due in court because they're coming after him. And so Zuckerberg, if you want to really nail it down, he obviously is trying to play both sides of the fence. He's probably, he's done with the pressure system, but the problem is it's not going to leave you, bud. It's going nowhere. It may have calmed down because they don't have anything they need it for right now, but if you stay in that position, and I really wonder if this is why Dorsey left. I think Dorsey was so sick of all of it. He was done that he left Twitter. And there are things that he said out to Elon Musk that make you wonder, maybe he's he's finally, you know, he got to drink his chai tea and, and hang out uh, with other crazy hipsters on a mountaintop retreat and heard gong circles going on or whatever you call them, the bowls. And he had an epiphany as he was meditating that, oh, I was participating in evil. I should probably talk to Musk. But Jack Dorsey left. Musk has been nailed with all kinds of stuff. Duroff got arrested in France. And then there's somebody like Mark Zuckerberg, who, yeah, he gets hauled before a commissional, co- congressional hearing, yet never really faces any true trouble. And when he starts facing real true trouble, I'll know he's actually doing something. I'll know he's stepping against it. But they won't. I don't think they will. And the proof is in the pudding. We'll wait and see. Maybe he'll come out and come out, you know, 20 pounds more muscle, leaning slightly more conservative, and he'll say, no, free speech. I want people to be able to say what they need to say. But isn't it funny that You got X, they go after. The EU threatens. Brazil threatens. All of them threaten. Rumble, who they've been through all of their pain and suffering and torment. Telegram. Facebook and Instagram, they they get hit by useless, strongly worded letters by the government. So we'll see. And guys, I want you to put your thoughts. I'm so glad that you watched So glad that maybe I could help fill you in on where I think Zuckerberg is at. And why does this matter? Let's end it with this. Why why even talk about this? Doesn't it seem like it's just drama? Because what the media will have you believing and the government will have you believing is, no, they don't really talk a whole lot and it's for your good when they do. And no, they're not. they, They will lie to you and tell you, no, we're, we're not really censoring anything. This isn't a First Amendment issue. And that's what they'll say. They'll say, well, it's not a First Amendment issue because we're not, we're not you know, bringing a law against anybody. We're not the ones censoring. It's the platforms making the decision. Yet you have government officials berating Facebook staff, yelling at them. And Facebook staff internally are going, we're at a crossroads where this relationship could really go sour fast. Which means they know if that relationship goes sour, then all of a sudden the brute force of the government is coming down on them. But it gets worse in terms of First Amendment. Because that's bad. That's awful. That's evil. But this end around that the government has decided is is really useful for them is all we have to do is suggest to the platform, and the platform will follow what we want them to do. And then we can suppress the speech of the private citizen, and guess what? It's a private business that is shutting them down. So who cares? We don't care. Except the government should not. And I believe this could be 
very strongly a constitutional issue, the government should not be determining what is true or false. Not your job. Not your job. Your job is to determine the laws as they fall constitutionally. Your job is to enforce those laws. And your job is to interpret those laws. Your job on the outside is to defend us from foreigner, foreign invaders and come up with treaties, truces, that kind of thing on a global scale. You're representing us on a global scale. I don't need you to determine whether or not my vaccine information is right or not. And for you to label and categorize me as, well, you know, resistant to vaccine information and resistant to authoritarian government. Because I am. And a little flattered that you thought of me, but back off. You are that creep in the bar that I don't want anything to do with. Ladies, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Anyways, I'm going to get off here before I <laughs> keep going. So this is something that, as always, I say pay attention to because the social media social media is such a major communication process. It, 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 it's the avenue. It is the public square. And we have to be sure that we protect it in the proper way, just like you would not want somebody – forcing you out in the public square because, well, they don't want to hear what you have to say. That can the Government is subversive. They're subtle. They find any way they can to get what they want because they are people, they are people, they are human beings who want power. And plenty of them think they're doing right. They just need more power. So I hope all of you have a great day. So thankful for everybody who watched. And guess what? We will see you tomorrow. All right.